So Dan gets to talk to us about some smelly stuff. So with that, we'll get going. <laughs> well, good afternoon, and thanks for uh, coming out to the uh, to the talk I have here. I think I can uh, summarize it very quickly. It's a very uh, simple, straightforward story. Basically, uh, reduced sulfur emissions coming from uh, feeding distillers byproducts uh, are enhanced. And I think uh, you'll see it's, it's, uh, there's some pretty decent evidence here uh, over a series of three studies. We tried to find out a little bit of information about where these uh, uh, emissions are happening and the relative magnitude of these emissions. Oh, I should go back and uh, talk about my, um, my co-authors are Mindy Spees and Brian Woodbury. Both of them have been instrumental in helping uh, uh, conduct some work out at Clay Center where uh, they were able to uh, set up some feeding trials looking at standard rations for um, uh, Nebraska, which are basically the dry rolled rations that uh, Andy was talking about earlier, and uh, rations involving distillers byproducts, which we seem to have an ample supply of in, in Nebraska. Uh, it also goes back a few years to some studies that Vince Merrill was involved in before he retired. And I should also uh, thank um, technical support at this point in time, uh, Ryan McGee and his wife, uh, Jennifer, and also Al Kruger for their work in collecting some of this data. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay. So why study uh, reduced sulfur in these uh, cattle feedlots? Um, of course, like you were saying, it's very smelly. Uh, the smell of rotten eggs is basically uh, the smell of reduced sulfur. Uh, but it's not just hydrogen sulfide. You also have uh, methyl sulfides, which have even uh, uh, lower detection thresholds, part per billion level. Um, certainly when folks get uh, uh, complaints about their operations smelling when they're, when they're uh, applying the manure, uh, often a component, a strong component of that odor is coming from these uh, reduced sulfur compounds. Certainly they're not, uh, we don't associate them with uh, global warming or uh, uh, other, other uh, issues say with uh, ammonia, but they are uh, obnoxious uh, compounds. There's also an issue with uh, uh, reporting, although I think you'll see that this is really not an issue in feedlots. Um, certainly uh, for worker safety, there are some uh, levels of 30 and 70 part per billion, which um, according to OSHA should not be, be reached. But in feedlots, the, the concentration is actually quite low. This is a study uh, published in 2004, looking at about three different feedlots. I think Brian might even remember some of this work since he, he and I started about that time. You can see that the levels of reduced sulfur are around four part per billion to maybe eight part per billion. There's a nice dial cycle there. Um, certainly this is way below the uh, 30 to 70 part per billion that uh, seems to be a, uh, an issue with worker health. So um, why, how is this related to distillers byproducts? Certainly uh, wet distillers grains with solubles is a resource that has really uh, uh, been utilized in Nebraska and Iowa where you have these uh, large uh, corn production sites. Let's see if I can get a little less feedback here. Maybe that's better? Still hear me? Okay. Um, as such, you don't have as much dry rolled corn to feed the animals, but luckily you can actually feed them the distiller's grains with solubles. It's depleted in starch, it is enriched in crude protein, so high levels of nitrogen. It also has uh, oil and phosphorus and also excess sulfur. Sulfate is also uh, found in this uh, material due to uh, sulfuric acid being used in the production process for uh, uh, the distillation of the, of the uh, alcohols. So these things uh, are fed also at high levels, up to 50%. Um, have they been fed even higher? I don't know, 60%? Some studies have, have looked at that. But I think uh, generally right around 40, 50%, they feed as much of these as they can. So how, how does this uh, reduced sulfur come about? Well, you have sulfate, and you also have amino acids in the material. Rumen bacteria will take the sulfate uh, through anaer anaerobic respiration, convert that to hydrogen sulfide. You also have amino acid fermentation, where that's where you get the uh, methyl sulfides being produced. 
So some basic research questions I had coming in was, was how does diet, this uh, effect of distiller's grains versus uh, traditional uh, ration, affect sulfur emissions? Uh, also, uh, where is it predominantly coming from? Is it just outgassing from the manure, or are we finding it more in the soil in some of these areas? And finally, within the cattle feedlot pen itself, uh, the pen is not a, a uniform surface. There's mounds, there's edges, there's wet areas. Are there particular areas of the pen where you can have a large sulfur emission? If so, maybe what we can do is we can manage those areas of the pen uh, if we want to control for odor a little bit more. So the first study, and this is uh, what I'll describe to you is actually three studies done over a period of several years, involves, uh, this first study involved uh, some steer calves in rather small pens on a concrete floor. They were fed four different levels of distiller's grains on a dry matter basis, 0, 20, 40, and 60. Pens were cleaned at three to four week intervals and the manure was composited uh, immediately after the pens were cleaned, so I collected the freshest manure I could and uh, measured the hydrogen, sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfide content of the manure because I wanted to know if it was already present in the manure or if it was being produced afterwards. And then we also determined the relative uh, total uh, reduced uh, sulfur emission from these samples. The manure composition, of course, uh, total sulfur, which has been reported other places, increases as you feed more and more uh, distillers' byproducts. Uh, interestingly, uh, analyzed for hydrogen sulfide uh, a small proportion of the total sulfur, you can see there's comparing milligrams per gram versus micrograms per gram. So we're talking about a thousand fold less. There's still hydrogen sulfide present and it uh, increases as the amount of distillers grains is fed to animals. So uh, looking at this data, it appeared that there was a roughly some point after 20% inclusion of distillers grains, we see a significant increase in hydrogen sulfide. That's content in the manure. So measuring the relative total uh, reduced sulfur emission, and, and Andy may get on me a little bit about this, but this is one of these little chambers where uh, uh, Brian and I kind of set up a, a system where uh, you could introduce a manure sample to the chamber, which is down here in this little uh, petri dish. In the chamber you have a fan, so it's constantly mixing. You have clean air coming out and uh, odorous air, I'm sorry, clean air going in and, and odorous air being uh, pumped out. And then you can sample the total reduced sulfur using a drone meter. It doesn't give you an exact measure of hydrogen sulfide or methyl sulfides or anything else. It gives you this, this kind of this measure that's a composite. But it, it, it gives it to you in, in the equivalence of hydrogen sulfide. So, uh, Using this, uh, we set up a, a protocol where we used a fresh manure sample, always the same area. Of course, if you increase the area, you get a, a, a larger emission. Airflow has remained uh, constant, and we sampled the, uh, the airstream. Typical profiles look like this. If you keep, start taking gas samples uh, with a strong manure source, the amount of hydrogen sulfide that you measured slowly built up, and then it would uh, eat basically equilibrate within the chamber. There was enough uh, hydrogen sulfide coming off of the uh, manure to, to equalize what was being pulled out. As you can see, if you remove the manure, immediately it went back to zero. So it was related to the, the manure sample itself. And you could actually cycle through a large number of samples quickly. So uh, for comparisons, we always took the three highest levels and averaged those and subtracted any background that we might have. And that, the background ended up being much more important when we looked at feedlot surfaces, which were very low emitters. So in this first study, we saw as the percentage of distiller's grains uh, went past 20%, we started seeing uh, an effect of emission from the manure. If you look on the left hand, uh, the, the vertical axis there, that's uh, reduced sulfur in part per million. So it looks like uh, at zero, zero inclusion, you had about 250 part per billion coming off of just regular manure. But then as you got up to 60% inclusion of distillers, you were looking at uh, up to 2,500 uh, part per billion uh, hydrogen sulfide in the stream of air coming off of that sample. 
So the question was, is uh, the study was conducted in a fairly small, controlled way, but nothing that, that looks like a real feedlot. So the second study was a set of eight pens where we looked at just two levels of uh, um, distillers grain, zero and 40%. We'd collect a manure composite near the feed bunk, that's often where the animals were defecating the most, and we looked at that at roughly monthly intervals to, to look at uh, relative hydrogen sulfide emission. And in this study, uh, we looked at four different dates. We saw significant effects on two of those dates. And on the other two dates, there was a strong trend, uh, a tendency for uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, emissions to be larger when we included the, the uh, uh, distiller's grains at 40%. The relative increase was roughly uh, 0.7 to 2.5 fold higher. So we, we are seeing in a, in a real uh, system the, uh, the effect of uh, di uh, including distillers, uh, distillers grains. Uh, where there's, there appeared to be some lower emissions, I think it was, it was really related to low moisture content in the, the manure sample that we, we got. Moving on to kind of a second phase in that study, the question was, well, after you remove the animals, was there a lingering effect? So we wanted to go around and actually use these chambers in the field and look at spots in the, the actual pen and determine if, uh, if we see a larger flux from, from the pens where we had been feeding the distillers. Uh, we looked at also uh, mound versus edge and we used uh, a, a technique that involves electrical conductivity to, to uh, uh, educate us as to which 20 sites we wanted to check in the pen to try and account for as much variability within the pen as possible. This is kind of what it looks like, the same sort of chambers. Um, these were operated in a recirculating mode where we had uh, cartridges that would strip out hydrogen sulfide for air entering the chamber and then as the chamber, as uh, the air was mixed in the chamber and then withdrawn, we could sample the, uh, the gas for hydrogen sulfide and then return the air back through that scrubbing cartridge into the chamber, okay? So it was, it was a closed loop type of system. We also had a, uh, the rubber mat there to help cut down on any uh, losses of gases from air moving into the side. If we just put these chambers out without the rubber mats, we often found that we, we had a, a lot of leaks in the system. So looking at uh, diet was significant. Site versus, and for site what we looked at was the mound area, which was the central part of the pen, and then the edge, which was often uh, wetter, more organic. And uh, that, each of those had a significant effect on the hydrogen sulfide emission. Looking at the dry rolled versus distiller's grain for the mound, there wasn't as big an effect between those two, but for edge, there was a, a strong uh, effect of distiller's grains. So we wanted to take this the, kind of to the final step and look at a whole production cycle, go into the pens, take a look at the gas emissions while animals were actually utilizing the pens and see how, how, this, uh, how the gas emissions from the pen surface uh, were affected. Uh, we did this looking at, uh, actually it was three levels, this slide's incorrect, zero, and then the, the diet would be ramped up to around 14% distiller's grains, and then the final level was about 35% distiller's grains. So what this data looks like, we went in at seven different time periods. Period one, everything was 0% uh, distiller's. Period two was at 14. Period three was back to 0%, but the pens were not cleaned. Period four, I think we ramped it up to 14. Period five was 14. Period six and seven were then at the uh, full level of 35% distillers. And this was over two production cycles. And you can see from, uh, from the data, uh, the, the flux was roughly uh, 0.3 to four-fold higher on five of the seven dates. On the final date, there was also a tendency for the flux to be higher. It is consistent with the with the previous studies. Looking at mound versus edge, there was actually not a significant effect uh, looking at distiller's grains mound versus edge in the pen. When we looked at control, we actually saw an effect, and I think that's related to the edge of the uh, pens being a little more moist. So uh, 
looking at mound versus uh, mound samples with uh, the distillers versus control, there was a significant effect, and also edge, looking at distillers versus control, there was uh, a significant effect. So I think this, this really does paint a very clear picture. Distillers grains enhance uh, uh, the, the hydrogen sulfide emissions from these sources. Uh, dye is important. It looks like there's a, a kind of a threshold for at 40%, we start to see a real effect happening. Um, for the source, manure was the strongest. I don't know if, if I, I should have pointed it out a little clearer, but for the manure, um, we're looking at part per million types of emission using that system, and that was from a small petri dish of manure. If you looked at the full uh, width of the, uh, the chamber itself, we're looking at part per billion, so that the data from earlier was around maybe 20 part per billion on average for that site. So there is quite a sizable difference. And then looking at location, uh, pen edges seem to be more important than the mound as a site. So future directions, um, I'm really interested kind of in the mechanism for this emission. Is it just degassing from manure and the soil that's already there? Or do we have some mi microorganisms involved where sulfate is uh, being uh, 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 urinated on the surface uh, in the manure? And uh, are, as uh, the system gets wet, we have uh, sulfur reduction to produce the hydrogen sulfide. I think that's an interesting question to look at. Um, does this matter at the fence line? Hydrogen sulfide is very reactive in the atmosphere. Even if we're getting, say, fourfold higher relative emission rates, um, by the time the air travels to that fence line, a lot of chemistry has gone on. Um, often at the fence line, you won't see hydrogen sulfide uh, very high. So uh, I think that's an interesting question for maybe uh, some of the atmosphere's chemi atmospheric chemists to, to look at. And finally, uh, one thing that might help out is, is you can produce distillers uh, and ethanol without having to utilize sulfur, the sulfuric acid. There's lots of other acids out there that could be used. So if you have a low sulfur distiller's uh, byproduct, that should actually uh, cover or, uh, or uh, get rid of any, any potential for hydrogen sulfide emissions above and beyond, the, let's say, a normal ration. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to entertain them. Questions for Dan? Yes. Have there been any other findings of higher sulfur or methane or any other gases at fence lines like that? Um, well, with, with the distillers, yeah. certainly um, uh, ammonia, it's well described that you get, have much higher fluxes of ammonia because there's more free protein in the diet. Um, methane, I'm not sure if there's any, anybody has seen methane. Um, if you do have high, higher ammonia, you can also have higher nitrous oxide. Um, I'm not sure if any of that data was, uh, uh, I'd have to talk to Mindy Spees to see if she looked at that. I'm not sure if she actually saw higher nitrous oxide coming off the sides. What about that fence line effect? Is that commonly known or? Well, for hydrogen sulfide, just because it's so easily oxidized in the air, um, that's why it's often ignored as a, as a trace gas. Um, typically, uh, where you have big problems with hydrogen sulfide is in dairies when you're applying the manure out of the center pivot and it's right next to somebody's house, then people notice that. Thank you. One more question? Oh, sure. Um, I've talked to ethanol people about using some other acid. What are you finding? I mean, they just don't want to use something different than sulfur gas. I, I think it's all economic economically driven. You know, the, the sulfuric acid is, is cheap and the other alternative would be something like hydrochloric, which is more expensive. You know, because I've, I've told them, I didn't have to, if you were the premium, you just a little product, and because you can feed more, I mean, the economics in the long run would be good for them, but you can't seem to. You see, it's not their problem. Yeah. Once, once they, they ship it out off of their uh, site, it's not their problem anymore. Yeah, I, I think they could uh, could get a uh, say a premium for that kind of feed, but even even so, hydrogen sulfide is not a priority gas emission. It's an interesting gas to look at, but there's no economics behind producing hydrogen sulfide emissions. Okay, let's thank Dan.